we are looking at the International Decade for People of African Descent Assembly, Guyana, and the African Guyanese Quest for Recognition, Justice, and Development in Oil Rich Guyana Beyond Policy Towards an Effective Implementation Framework for Achieving the Goals of the Decade and Beyond. My name is Enrico Wilford, and I'll be your moderator for this special presentation. And uh, joining me on the program, on the presentation, would be panelists. They would be Paul Flo, the former Assistant uh, Commissioner of Police and former Chairman of the Police Service Commission, the social commentator, J.J. Lau will join us on the program. We will also be joined on the program as, for, as a panelist by Trevor Ben, uh, who was the uh, former commissioner of the Guyana Lands and Surveys Department and prominent attorney Nigel Hughes. Recording in progress. The presentation on this special program. So we'll go now to the presentations from the panelists. While we await those presentations, let me tell you that the panelists will explore the status of African Guyanese in relation to other ethnic groups in Guyana's economy, expanding largely from the profits of oil and gas production, and uh, recommend institutional and program arrangements that seek to eliminate racism and racial discrimination and achieve economic and social equity. Now to the presentations. B in Guyana is in a perilous position. This is due to several factors, including a demoralized Guyana police force. The Guyana police force is the major law enforcement agency in Guyana. The force is a national force and has jurisdiction throughout the country. The Guyana police force is divided into 12 regional police divisions, which are generally aligned to the 10 administrative regions of the country. These are Regional Police Division 1, Regional Police Division 2, Regional Division 3, Regional Police Division 4, Regional Police Division 4A, 4B, and 4C, Regional Police Division 5, Regional Police Division 6, Regional Police Division 7, Regional Police Division 8, Regional Police Division 9, and Regional Police Division 10. These are in addition to several branches at police force headquarters. Due to historical factors, the Guyana police force is dominated by Afro-Guyanese personnel, both male and female. It is suggested by some that many factors, including government policies, religious beliefs, demographic, among others, have led to this situation. Over the years, there have been several commissions, including the Discipline Forces Commission, that have addressed the issue and made recommendations to address this numerical imbalance. However, despite all efforts, the imbalance remains. The People of Progressive Party, whilst in and out of government, made several public statements about the need to address the numerical imbalance in the security forces, including the Ghana Police Force. Despite all their efforts, the situation has remained. Since assuming office in 2020, 
The current government has made a concerted effort to place Indo-Guyanese police officers in senior management positions at the expense of their more senior and qualified Afro-Guyanese counterparts. Currently, police divisions 1, 2, 3, 4B, 4C, and 6 are commanded by Indo-Guyanese police officers. In many cases, they lack the experience and qualification to hold those senior positions. The only reason they were placed in those positions is because of their ethnicity and the belief that they are supporters of the current government. In many cases, the second in command and other senior positions in those regional police divisions are held by Indo-Guyanese police officers. In addition, several important departments and offices within the force, such as Deputy Commissioner Operations, Head of the Special Organized Crime Unit, and Police Finance Officer, are held by Indo-Guyanese policemen, most of whom are unqualified for those positions. It is significant to note that the regional police divisions listed above police the major population centers in Guyana. Conversely, the regional police divisions commanded by Afro-Guyanese policemen, apart from regional police division 4A, 5, and 10, are in the remote areas of Guyana with sparse populations. It was also noted that during the recent promotions of senior officers of the, of the eight persons promoted to the rank of assistant commissioner, only three were Afro-Guyanese policemen. In the case of the 11 ranks promoted to senior superintendent, only four were Af Afro-Guyanese policemen. In the case of In superintendents, only eight Afro-Guyanese policemen were promoted out of a list of 21. Similarly, this proportionality was observed in the other rank structures. This disproportionality is difficult to justify given the numerical dominance of pro Guyanese policemen and women. The map illustrates what can be defined as a well orchestrated program by the current government to position and promote Indo Guyanese policemen at the expense of their Afro Guyanese counterparts. The murder of Quindon Bacchus. Quindon Bacchus was a male Afro Guyanese who resided at Golden Grove a village on the east coast of Demerara in Guyana. According to reports, Bacchus was suspected to be in possession of, a, of an illegal firearm, which he offered for sale. The police, on receipt of this information, mounted a sting operation to apprehend Bacchus. The ranks involved in the operation included both Afro and Indo-Guyanese policemen. During the course of the operation, Bacchus ran away from the policemen. He was pursued by several ranks, including both Afro and Indo-Guyanese ranks. During the pursuit, several bullets were discharged at Bacchus, and he was struck and killed. The evidence suggests that bullets were fired by several policemen, including at least one of the Indo-Guyanese policemen. The police investigation which followed, and which was supervised by the Police Complaints Authority, found that several policemen were culpable in the killing of Bacchus. Those ranks included both Afro and Indo policemen. However, only three Afro policemen were charged, one for murder and the other two for perverting the course of justice. The evidence clearly shows that three indo guyanese policemen who were involved in the operation were also culpable in some way or the other, yet no charge was filed against them. It is the widely held view that the only reason the Indo police officers were not charged was because of their ethnicity. What is even more absurd is the fact that one of the Afro policemen charged with perverting the course of justice was never at the scene of the incident and was not involved in the operation. These are just a few of the many cases that clearly shows that there is a concerted and sustained effort by the current government to marginalize, criminalize, and discriminate against Afro-Guyanese policemen and women solely because of their ethnicity and the perception that Afro-Guyanese policemen and women support the opposition political parties. This is a situation of great concern. This situation has led to the demoralization of the Afro-Guyanese policemen and women, which can have great adverse consequences for national security. 
I'm Gabriel Lal. Lots of you know me as GHK Lal. I have been privileged to be invited to share in this brief conversation with you on an issue. It is not something that I prefer to speak about because it's so disturbing. It's so harrowing to those who are victimized by it. It's discrimination, and it's specifically discrimination against African Guyanese in Guyana. Now, you'll hear me talk about African Guyanese and black Guyanese interchangeably, same people, and Indian Guyanese or Indo-Guyanese, same setup. Discrimination against African Guyanese in the international decade of peoples of African descent is even more more troubling, more traumatic to the spirit, given what is going on. And I've been asked, because of my little role, my little contributions as a public commentator, a returning Guyanese, to share a little bit about discrimination against black Guyanese. And today I want to focus on two areas specifically, discrimination in the public service against black Guyanese, and discrimination in cash handouts, relief monies, against black Guyanese. We will segue from that into what foreign observers have put on the table publicly in this country, some of them right here and some of them outside of here. Discrimination in the public service against African Guyanese. Some examples. The Forestry Commission, the Guyana Forestry Commission, over 100 Guyanese were terminated when the People's Progressive Party, the Indo-dominated government, came into power in 2020. The overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of those 100, over 100, are African Guyanese descent. Speaks for itself. Isolated. I give you the Ministry of Natural Resources. 26 members of a Corps of Warden were terminated. The Corps of Wardens are those people who are ex-army officers mainly, police people, security people, who patrol our vast hinterlands where mining operations occur. I should tell you, it's a wide open frontier, a pretty lawless place where the big and the powerful make their own rules as they go along. They're a law unto themselves. So the Corps of Wardens is that little sanity check. 24 out of the 26 members of the Corps of Wardens that were terminated are of African Guyanese descent. Should I say more? At the Ministry of Education, our teachers, it's a long, drawn-out story, and I'll try to compress this as best as I can. Black Guyanese teachers are being forced into early retirement, replaced by Indo-Guyanese. Black retirees, teacher retirees, are not being called upon to come back, but their retired Indo-Guyanese counterparts are being called upon. There's something insidious going on at the Ministry of Education. There is the political uh, directors there, actors there, have this tendency, this practice, of putting black Guyanese faces to do their dirty jobs. I know some of them very well, having close acquaintance with them in various other settings. They are the ones who draw the lines to those who come complaining, appealing, hoping for some sort of remedial action when they have been denied a promotion, a transfer, or some sort of benefit that is due to all teachers. That is something that they have merited. Talking about merit, we have our teachers and our black Guyanese teachers are being sent to the junior schools where the senior schools, the top schools, 
are being peopled predominantly flooded, is the word that was used to me, by Indo-Guyanese. In terms of benefits, run-of-the-mill stuff, routine stuff, higher education, pursuing ed skills, op opportunities in education for them to become better instructors in the classroom so that we can have a better student to put out into society to represent this country at this particular time in our history when we need them the most, when we need a better caliber of student that's being lost. They are because our black teachers are being given the royal runaround where higher education is concerned. Access to it, the availability of it to them, not there. Not there. There is another thing. Teachers, black teachers primarily, their contracts are sitting on desks, many of them, dozens of them, I understand, are sitting on desks in the Ministry of Education and they are not being signed. I understand they are in different departments, they go to very, very high up in the ministry. Some of these contracts have been languishing, suspended in midair, nowhere, man, nowhere, no man's land, for months. And I understand there are some instances that are close to a year. Taken together, we have this situation here in, with our educators, where they are being made to feel the brunt of the punitive, vindictive nature of an Indian-dominated government. At Queen's College, there was a class that was videotaped, and it's almost exclusively Indo-Guyanese students. We've got a tremendous contingent of black students in this country, quality black students. How come it wasn't seen fit to at least insert them into pictures like that? Those that qualify, not for the show of it, this is what troubles people like me the few that are giving a voice to the voiceless, giving a hearing to those who are suppressed and oppressed and prevented from being heard. The president in August gathered what's called a youth advisory group, a youth advisory group. It was conspicuous in that its members were primarily of one ethnicity, Indo-Guyanese. This is not good. None of this is good. Forestry, natural resources, education, the Ministry of Social Protection, where between 25 and 40 people were terminated, most of them black African Guyanese, sometimes for no reason, and sometimes for the most frivolous of reasons, the flimsiest of reasons. It is not good in a polarized society. It's not good in a society that is bedeviled by politics. And when we talk about politics in Guyana, we are talking about race, Indo Indian versus black. It's got to be faced. It's the 800-pound gorilla in our, on a, in our room and sitting in the center of our table. We need knitting that will lead to mending, that will lead to healing in this country, the reconciling at a national level that seems to elude us because nobody wants to address it. Instead of that, we have these punitive measures, these very well thought out, well planned, well orchestrated and well implemented situations where African Guyanese are targeted in various state in the public service. I think it speaks for itself and what I'm telling you today represents only a snapshot. I know, I know these people, not all of them, but quite a few of them. I have relationships with them. And as such, they have come across to me as sincere and hurt and really troubled by what is happening to them. But they are fearful. This point has to be interjected here. They are fearful. There's a climate of fear in this country because here's the reality. Anybody speaking about discrimination, a black Guyanese dare to speak about discrimination in this country against them, meted out by the Indo-Guyanese People's Progressive Party government, is running the risk of ruining their work life for the rest of their lives. Because outside of the public service, you have a big private sector, but the private sector is dominated by Indo-Guyanese. They are apprehensive 
about possibly going against the tide and by hiring people who may have been marked. They don't want to jeopardize their interests. They do not want to spoil the benefits that are coming to them and for which they have been lavish recipients. Now, in terms of the public service, I think what I've put on the table today, in very simple terms, very straightforward manner, it's, I think there is a sufficiency of persuasion here that we've got a problem. And I think it's a big problem. It may be overt, it definitely is covert. It's unofficial, it's informal, it's unwritten, but it's very, very much there. And I'll tell you something that was really stark and sinister. A black Guyanese worker in one state agency was terminated. And there was the wherewithal to go after his wife, also a black Guyanese, in another state agency and get rid of her too. So this was not accidental or random, in my humble opinion. It's people, they're sitting down and there's some list, I don't know if it's actually on paper, some list somewhere where they saying, these are the people that we don't want around here. These are the people that we need to be out of here. Public service, I've put it before you folks, this is what it is right now in Guyana, and it's traumatic, and it's terrible. Cash handouts, the second issue I thought I'd speak about today. Cash handouts. We've had a five of them. Call them what you want. Relief money, charity, a stitch in time. COVID-19. That was the one for 25,000 Guyana dollars that was truly national in scope where everybody should have gotten. Most people got, including, let's be frank here, let's be fair, black Guyanese. But a number of people were left out for one reason or another. When I say left out, they may be missed, they may not have been there, or they were just bypassed. Be that as it may, that one was national in scope. Sugar workers, who, which is predominantly Indian, the prime minister himself said in a recent writing, that is 80% Indians. So that's four out of five Indians, so 20%, the, the subtraction leads to black Guyanese. They got $250,000 in relief money. I think there was a second one in another place that all of them didn't get, but $250,000 for Indo-Guyanese supporters of the PPP Indian-dominated government. Fisher folk, they got 150,000. Another constituency, another sector of the Guyanese demographic that is primarily Indian. Farmers, we had what was called the biggest flood, one of the biggest natural disasters that we may have ever encountered in any form. And my understanding is that the monies that were shared out as cash relief was anywhere from $50,000 to as much as $2 million. Farmers have black Guyanese in the midst, but it's again overwhelmingly Indian. So there's a common thread here. There's a common denominator that keeps raising its head up. The constituencies that have benefited immensely in the six-figure amounts are Indian-dominated areas or sectors. The private sector, Indian-dominated, has benefited from all manner of exem exemptions and relief from the government. Now, indigenous communities, we're talking about primarily African Guyanese, indigenous communities were given a $25,000 relief fund. They are all riverine communities, so they are farmers and they are fishers, but they got that one. They have been discriminated against, and that's a whole can of worms all by itself. So when we look at it, 25,000 for Guyanese, all Guyanese. Black Guyanese got part of that, and the rest, they have been crying out for relief for the longest while. Public servants, we go back to them. They have been calling for a livable wage. They have been crying for a livable wage. They got 8%. Yet the people who were entertaining at the cricket carnival got 100% of what they got before. 
something is wrong with the math there. Maybe something is wrong with my head, with my reasoning, and I'm willing to concede that. But I'm not willing to concede that 8% equals 100%, and all those cash relief monies equates to what African Guyanese got on the one hand for COVID relief versus what the rest, the indo Guyanese got in various sectors. Something is not adding up here. Or to put it even more bluntly, something is terribly, terribly wrong here. Using the public service on which I am speaking about and cash handouts, these two areas, I go now to the commentary, the postures coming out of officials in this country, recognized officials. Her Excellency, the U.S. Ambassador to Guyana, Sarah Ann Lynch, by my count, she has spoken five times about using the word inclusion. Five times. The first time she lent her voice to that was in October 2020, three months after the PPP came into power. And she signaled her intention to be a part of any push for inclusion in Guyana with any civil society group. That was October 2020. July 4th, at her official residence with the President of Guyana and the Vice President of Guyana in attendance among assembled dignitaries, members of the diplomatic corps. The Vice President, I should, should say, is a former head of state of this country for an extended period. In front of them all, she spoke about a number of things, but she used that magic word again, inclusion, the need for it. Go back a few months before July the 4th, on the anniversary of Guyana's Republic Day celebration, President Joe Biden, in his message to this country, said the United States stands ready to help us to reinforce democratic values. I think that's standard fear. But then he went on further and to promote inclusive economic growth. We may try to beat this word inclusive down into the ground, but here are the others talking about it. USAID spoke about it. Anthony Blinken, the United States Secretary of State, on July 27th, spoke about inclusion in Guyana and the need for it to President Ali and the Vice President, who were in a face-to-face in -face discussion with him on an official visit. President, Vice President, Secretary of State, U.S. Ambassador, U.S. Aid, an official state, United States agency, and the British uh, officials have, already, have also spoken. A, B, C, D, and E, I think the Americans and the British are speaking for them. They're taking the lead on this. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. We don't have enough of it. We need more of it. And when we use the word inclusion, it means that there's some form of exclusion. There is a degree of exclusion, and it is troubling to the Americans. OPEC Plus has signaled that it's not going to, that the Saudis particularly, is not so friendly to Western needs, given the Ukraine war. Guyana's oil become, I submit and I put on a table, Guyana's oil, it's 11 billion barrels, becomes very crucial to Western interests. It's oil and gas. Therefore, the Americans and the British and the Canadians do not want any kind of trouble here, any kind of instability that will be a problem for their investors. The U.S. Ambassador during Thanksgiving week, if I have this right, in an interview, used the, spoke again of inclusion. Again and again, this tireless worker, whether we like her or not, whether we agree with her or not, has been talking about inclusion. Something tells a silly fellow like me that she's onto something. That Americans with their range of technology, with their range of intelligence, has got a pretty good idea of where inclusion is in this country, or it's darker stepsister discrimination. Some sectors of this country, some people in this country have used the word, the A word. It's a hated word, apartheid. And when it's, be, when it's used, I think, given where we are with discrimination, we have started, 
through our practices towards that road. Emerging was the word that he used, and it caused a tremendous storm in this country. But what are we going to do with the storms? Try to beat them out of existence? No. You try to do something about it. The Americans are talking about it. I am talking about it. Others are talking about it. Look, all we're trying to do here is shed some, speak to some truth and shed some light. Discrimination exists in Guyana. It's raging, it's rampant, and it's wrong. I am Gabriel Lal. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have shared this little message. And I pray and I hope and I trust that they will touch that there is some sort of intervention here. There's some sort of involvement that we can have better for African Guyanese first, indigenous Guyanese, and for all Guyanese. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Trevor Ben, and I'm coming from Guyana on the South American coast. Um, I'm here to discuss with you issues relating to land as it affects African Guyanese in the country. As some of you may already know, um, Guyana land laws are dated. It has been in place since the 1920s, our primary land laws have been in place since the 1920s, and they have not been updated um, in a comprehensive manner since 1920s. Several attempts have been made over the years to update those laws, but for many reasons that has not materialized. There are, however, 35 agencies that has something to do with land, that has responsibility for land in the country. And this, according to observers, have contributed to a very chaotic environment in the land administration across the country. Additionally, you might want to know that land is mentioned in our national anthem seven times. It, this, I believe, shows the importance the country plays in this important asset resource. The Constitution as well gives us um, two specific articles that refer to land. Again, these articles are very important and speaks to the um, Importance, of course, the, the government and the people of Guyana place on land. And the first article, Article 18, says that land is for social use and must go to the tiller. Any Guyanese occupying a portion of land could apply and eventually own those lands. Article 19, every citizen has the right to own personal property, which includes such assets as dwelling, houses, and the land on which they stand. You might want to know, however, that notwithstanding the importance placed on land and the, the need for it to be made available to every Guyanese, this is not the case. Land distribution is known to be very skewed against Guyanese of African descent. Residents of communities that are dominated by African Guyanese have over the years complained of the lack of access to titles to land on which they occupy. For example, Kokwani, in our in region number 10, Kildonan in region number 6, and Matthews Ridge in region number 1. These three communities have not received title to lands they have occupied for over 40 years. The first time they got title to those lands is in 2018, some four years ago, when a concerted effort was made to make sure that their wrong was right, righted. Many of these residents have been in occupation, like I said, for over four decades. 
in another African Guyanese community um, called Mocha on the east bank of Demerara. Over a thousand acres, what the villagers considered to be ancestral lands, were leased to four Guyanese of Indian origin in 2014. The four individuals have no connection to any of the residents of the village. The lands, however, have not been occupied by any of the four individuals, although they possess the lease, and they have been uh, presumably using it for collateral to acquire um, mortgages for the benefit of their families and businesses. Additionally, there is considerable bias in the distribution of land in Guyana. Between 1996 and 2011, large swaths of land, commercial, agricultural, mining, and residential land were distributed to mainly Guyanese of East Indian origin. The land distribution ranged between 1,000 and 100,000 acres to each landowner. It is believed that many of these titles, many of these lands were never occupied again by any of the people, and they again were used as collateral for loans. This is clearly a disadvantage to members of the African Guyanese community, given that whenever they do receive land, it is mostly for residential purposes. The government of Guyana has a very active public profile of residential land distribution. And this is where Guyanese of African origin would benefit. However, many of the land allotted to these African Guyanese are not surveyed or the area is not fully developed. Consequently, they are unable to occupy those lands. Most allottees also do not have access to financial resources to build, which result in the land being unoccupied for years in some cases. With respect to the retention of those lands, in most African Guyanese community, this is a, is a, is a challenge, and several reasons have been attributed to this. One such reason is the lack of access to financing. One woman of African descent approached four banks over an 11-year period for a mortgage to build a house on the land she acquired. All four banks turned her away. She eventually put the land up for sale. Fortunately for her, the Guyana Public Service Cooperative Credit Union, a predominantly black organization eventually came to our rescue, providing her with a mortgage. Many African Guyanese face this issue. The cost of construction is another issue that affects the retention of land in the African Guyanese community. The building costs has progressively increased beyond the reach of most Guyanese, but especially for African Guyanese. In this regard, there is need for concerted effort to be put in place to give focus to the issues affecting African Guyanese and their ownership of land. There's also need for a revamping of the laws affecting land in Guyana and for issues to be discussed among the beneficiaries to ensure that more land is made available to Guyanese of African origin and that they be given the necessary resources to occupy those lands. Thank you very much. We were listening there to Trevor Ben. He was giving us his thoughts on what has been happening with land distribution 
across uh, Guyana. And we are standing by to join Nigel Hughes, who will look at this issue that we are discussing here. This is a special presentation from the International Decade, Decade of People of African Descent, uh, the Guyana Assembly. And the idea is to look at the implementation of achievable goals with regard to African Guyanese and discrimination and racism and what have you within Guyana. We are standing by to join Nigel Hughes, who will make his presentation. Good afternoon, Enrico. Good afternoon to your audience. And uh, may I say thank you very much for affording me this opportunity. My presentation is going to be a PowerPoint presentation of data that has been acquired in relation to the allocation of resources by the government in the award of contracts in various areas to the private sector and the identity of those persons who are in the private sector. It's entitled Economy and Justice in Guyana. Can I have the next slide, please? Right, now, the Ministry of Housing is one of the ministries in Guyana that is tasked with assigning and awarding government contracts. These contracts are locally funded through budgetary allocations and are awarded by the government of Guyana. Next slide. I start with the Ministry of Housing, but I go on. The three largest projects which have been awarded by that ministry are the following. The Schooner Project, $11 billion. That's the Crane Road Project. The Mandela Road project, Ecto Eccles, the four-lane project, that's $2.3 billion. And the Eccles to Diamond, the $13.38 uh, four-lane uh, billion, sorry, $13.3 billion four-lane project. This is how they've been alloc allocated. Next slide, please. And I put them, uh, the, the top eight. So VR Construction got $849 million. The numbers are there. That's an Indian Guyanese company. Avinash Contracting and Scrap Metal, 992 million Indian Guyanese. This third one is very, very interesting. Lahurst Construction Services. They got 2 billion, 146 million. Uh, you see the rest of the numbers there. This company, which is awarded to a Chinese and Indian Guyanese company, has no prior history of any road construction in the country. And it was awarded a $2.1 billion contract. We have Guy America Construction, Indian Guyanese company, 2.6 billion, no prior history of road construction. Can we have the next slide? AGM, no prior history, again, 1.8 billion. Buzz, 1.3 billion, that's an international company, Puran Brothers, Indian company, 1 billion. JS Guyana, uh, 927 million dollars. Now, in those top eight, allocations on the schooner project alone you of course observe that there's no allocation to any company uh that is african guyanese can i have the next slide the mandela echoes road this is the four lane project the size of that project 2.3 billion guy america construction 555 million dollars they're indian guyanese Mitzel Construction Owners Limited, uh, Brazilian Indian Guyanese, $364 million. Puran Brothers, $360 million Indian Guyanese. Those are the top three. Next slide, please. The Echoes uh, Mandela Road continued. For the first time, you see the appearance of an African Guyanese interest is at number four here, Colin Talbert and Aaron Lal, 256 million. And there you see, of course, it's a JV. Then you have at number five, you've got Bronco <laughs> Services, Indian Trinidadian, GS, Guyana Limited, Indian Trinidadian, 352 million. Next slide, please. The Eccles to Great Diamond Road. So this is a $13.3 billion project. S. Jagmohan, uh, and company, 1.2 billion Indian Guyanese. China Railroad, first, China Railway, sorry, first group, Chinese, billion dollars. 
Ivor Allen for the first time in this project, uh, African Guyanese coming in at 825 million Guyana dollars. Next slide. So of the $27.1 billion awarded by the Ministry of Housing, 17% was awarded to an African Guyanese company, and that company was in joint venture. The remaining 82.5% uh, is a combination of Indian and foreign Guyanese. Next slide, please. So we look at water treatment plants, and these are the official figures. So the first company, which got a $424 million project, uh, Compass in, uh, Industrial Services, we're not sure of their ethnicity. And then thereafter, you've got H naught, 593 million Indian, DNR construction, 278 million Indian, DAX construction, 2 billion, 6 to 9 uh, Indian, import, uh, international import and supplies, Indian Guyanese, Singh and Sons, 424, S. Jagmohan, 1 billion, 236, 700, Toshiba Water Solutions, an American company. So you've got a picture there, no African Guyanese featuring. Next slide, please. Procurement of drugs. This is between August 2020 and present. The total capital expenditure, 19.1 billion. New GPC got 13 billion of that, Indian Guyanese company. Western Scientific, which is a Trinidadian Indian company, 5 billion, 192. So no African Guyanese featuring in the procurement of drugs and equipment. Next slide, please. Now, these are the budgetary allocations published and presented uh, and uh, which became part of the uh, act in region four, which is the most populous region in the country where at least 41% of the population reside. That region got an allocation of 781 uh, million Guyana dollars. Compared with region six, where between 15 to 18% of the population reside, they got $962,500,000, more than, and that's with between 15 and 18% of the population, where region four, the most populous, got 781, mm -hmm. and region three, where between 18 to 20% of the population resides, they got $890 million. So you see the comparison. Region four, which has most, uh, is predominantly an African Guyanese region, you see the numbers there. Next slide, please. So we come to the big elephant in the room, oil and gas. These are the petroleum blocks that were that have been awarded, and these are the blocks that are held by various companies, Stabrook, Demerara, Kaichor, Kanji, Orange, Kanuku. Next slide, please. Those are all the license holders. There are only two blocks which have uh, Guyanese, uh, that, that have a license, two blocks that have been awarded to Guyanese. The Kanji block, awarded to Indian Guyanese, and the Kaicho block, which is now held by a Portuguese Guyanese company. Now you will discover in the next slide, next, that there was no advertisement for the offer of sale for any of these offshore blocks. So it wasn't as if there was a and a public uh, advertisement saying, please, we're putting blocks up for sale, come and bid. These were all done by the government of the day at the time, which is the People's Progressive Party. Um, and Glenn Lal has described, sorry, Glenn, Gabriel Lal, sorry, has described them as being predominantly Indian-based and Indian influence. So there was no advertisement of the sale. If we go to the next slide, you will find that not a single African Guyanese or any African Guyanese entity has ever, ever been awarded an offshore block in Guyana. No African Guyanese. And you've got about 10 to 12 blocks already allocated and licensed. Of those two are Indian and not a single offshore block has been awarded to an African Guyanese or an African Guyanese entity. Next slide, please. We then come to shore bases. Now, shore bases are absolutely critical to the development of the oil and gas industry. It is from the shore base that the offshore FPSO receives its supplies, its services. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it's the lifeblood of the offshore entity. And right now, there's only one function in shore base in Ghana, which is the Ghana shore base, Gisby 
uh, their approximate value is 100 million US, uh, Guyana, uh, US dollars, and that's an Indian Guyanese company. Uh, though the other two, which have been um, approved, you've got NRG Holdings over at Breeden Hoop on the west coast uh, of Guyana. They have published that their investment is between 200 and 600 billion, uh, 600 million, sorry, uh, US dollars. That's an Indian and Portuguese entity. And in region four, Krong Mining, don't have any available figures at the moment. That's an Indian Guyanese. So the three shore bases, one operational and two to come in line, not one of those uh, shore bases, which service the offshore industry, which will service Liza 1, Liza 2, Yellowtail, the entire development program for offshore development of oil and gas for the next, I dare say, 20 to 25 years. These are just three. They're more down the line. None of them has been awarded to any interest that is African Guyanese. Next slide, please. We now come to gold licenses. These are persons who have been awarded licenses to export gold. Last year, in 2021, there were 11 I licenses issued to export gold from Guyana. Of those 11, nine were Indian and two were African Guyanese. So in other words, 18% of the licenses to export gold that were awarded last year went to African Guyanese. The remaining percentage went to Indian Guyanese. We now come to 2022. Next slide. Where the gold export licenses, they only issued six this year. Five went to Indian Guyanese, one went to an African Guyanese. So in other words, 16% of the licenses awarded for the export of gold went to African Guyanese. You see the numbers there. Next slide, please. We now come to the another very critical area, sand and stone quarries. As you know, to, to drive the infrastructural demand in Guyana, particularly roads, uh, you know, there's a great de uh, demand for stone. There's a great demand for sand. Guyana has no shortage of either. So we'll examine here the award, uh, the, the number of quarries that they are. So can I have the next slide? And these I list here. Uh, I think there's one before this. There's a slide before this, I believe. Right, um, and just click again. So I've just listed the top 22 uh, quarry licenses that have been issued. RMC Silica is the only one, and that has been, that's an old established uh, sand quarry uh, up on the Demerara River on the left bank. That's African Guyanese. As you can see, coming after that Black Jaguar investment, Indian. Vishwan Baichan, Indian. We are unaware of the ethnicity of the Alicia investment in constructioning. Then we have Hades. Hades have four. That's an Indian Guyanese uh, entity. In, they have four quarries. You then have Metallica. We're unaware of what their ethnicity is. Then Southern Canton uh, International Trading. This is Chinese, although of Mr. Su's fame, uh, we've all heard about. Next slide, please. Yeah, if you can bring up. Yeah, good. You've got York Investment, we're not sure about. Lorenzo Afonso, Port Portuguese. Mahendra Not Udit, Indian Guyanese. Pradeep Abdul, Indian Guyanese. Guanzhou and Ping, which is a new thriving good. Chinese, Tri Company, Indian. Barakara Quarries, that's a very old uh, quarry. It's been there for a long time, over 40 years. Indian Guyanese. BK Quarries, Indian Guyanese. BK Quarries, Indian Guyanese. Next slide. And Malali Kuali Kuali's next uh, Indian Guyanese. Can I now have the next slide? If you click, the entities will come up. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. Tulsi Pasad, been in the quarry business for a very long time, I think in excess of four decades. And then, of course, we have Prabhu Dial, Ram Dial, Indian Guyanese. So if you examine the quarry licenses, only one company there, which is Roraima, out of those 22 companies, um, that has got a license for quarry is African Guyanese. Next slide. Quarry allocations. Uh, I've just said that. So out of the 22, one, which is 4.5%, if you just want to get an idea 
about the distribution of the licenses which control the allocation of that particular of those resources, sand and stone. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is uh, the issue of how the transfer of resources to the Indian population over the last 25 years. The PPP came into government in 1992 and were in office until 2015 and then re, uh, regained office in 2020. During this period, there has been an almost exclusive transfer of state assets to Indian, by, uh, Indian businesses uh, on the similar scale to that that I've just demonstrated you. There, there are continuing studies that are being conducted now that will examine that period in greater detail, just as how I've uh, presented that. But perhaps more, more insidiously and, and a consequential um, effect of this is that where those resources got transferred to one sector of the, uh, of the population, and then the other sector was deprived of the ability to develop their companies, uh, to be able to successfully participate. So what then happens is after the passage of 10, 12 years, where there's been this flow and transfer of assets to one sector of the population, you then put in criteria that says, okay, to be able to win contracts, you've got to have 10 excavators, four, four tractors, uh, you know, so many bulldozers. And because the only companies that have had the benefit of the transfer of state resources and assets that were then placed in a position where they can actually buy the capital equipment, then once you start putting that criteria in place after 10, 15, 20 years, of course, the only companies that will actually qualify and matriculate to win contracts would be the companies who have benefited from this transfer of state assets over that period of time. Can we go to the next slide, please? Right. Now, there are always potential solutions, and I, I certainly don't pretend to have any or even the most of them, but I, I will certainly share what is on the statute books but has never been implemented. So we have the Small Business Act, and Section 11 of that act says the government shall use its best endeavors to ensure that at least 20% of the procurements of, pre -procure, procurement, sorry, of goods and services required annually by the government is obtained from small businesses. And for this purpose, the council should prepare an annual small business pro program, procurement program. Needless to say, this has never been implemented. The 20%, if you just think about the uh, size and scale of the award of government contracts now, if 20% went to those that have been disadvantaged, African, indigenous community, indigenous business, uh, it would be significant. This has never been implemented. Next slide, please. So I come to issues of justice. The Isaiah and Joel Henry uh, executions, I call them, murders in 2020, um, th that, that has been in, in the news forever from the time those young men were uh, executed. We have Orrin Boston, who was murdered while sleeping naked in his bed next to his wife in 2021. Quindon Bacchus, uh, shot multiple times by police officers in Guyana. And Tamika Clark, more, more recently, African Guyanese attorney who was arrested for advising her client to remain silent. Can I have the next slide? Right, so I, I've just set out here the details and and. The Isaiah and Joel Henry um, issue is, is particularly uh, disturbing because not only were Isaiah and Joel very brutally murdered, they were murdered until their heads were severed and hanging off by the hanging by skin off of their necks. Um, from the time that murder happened, it happened in the middle of an election period. Uh, the tensions were, of course, very high, country very ethnically sensitive. Because of the nature of the murder uh, and how brutal and gruesome they were, there was an immediate uh, offer um, and call, I should say, first before an offer that we should get the best experts globally to investigate th this particular murder because it came in a very bad time for Guyana in the middle of an election period. And so the natural accusations that flow from that is that there would be uh, there would be a, a rush, uh, depending on your ethnic uh, bias or your ethnic composition, to a particular conclusion. So the family and very many social, civil society groups, particularly the Ghana Human Rights Group, called for an international investigation. It wasn't just a call. 
They actually walked the talk. They went, they raised funds to bring to Guyana the foremost international forensic pathologist, uh, Dr. Frundenberg out of Argentina, flew him to Guyana at their expense. Uh, and he made, he and his team uh, made their expertise available to the Guyana police force and the government of Guyana at no cost to the government and said, look, we will assist you in the conduct of this investigation. They actually met with the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, Mr. McCormack from Guyana Human Rights and Dr. Frundenbar met with him and their offer of assistance was point blank refused. Uh, Dr. Frundenberg, of course, visited the scene, met with the uh, family. Now, shortly after Isaiah and Joel were murdered, maybe two or three days afterwards, a young gentleman by the name of Mr. Harris Singh was murdered. Nobody witnessed this murder that happened in the back, back, back down. After about a year, um, the police, because there was co constant pressure from the family of these murdered young men, took to investigate. The police arrested and charged two men who allegedly confessed. Now, these were two Indian persons who clearly, um, pro well, they protested from the time they were arrested on their way to court before the charges were read to them. They said they had been set up. And the only basis upon which these persons were charged, um, even the police admit this, is on alleged confessions by these two young men. The families of Joel and Isaiah continue to say they did not believe that the persons who ch were charged had anything to do with the death of Joel and Isaiah and continue to protest. And as their protests seemed to be gaining some uh, standing internationally, the police then arrested the son and brother of Isaiah Henry and, a, and three other people and arrested them for the murder of, of Harish Singh. Now, at the time when Harish Singh was murdered, all these young men, three of them, were at the wake. Uh, for those of you internationally who, who are unaware of what a wake is, a wake is a pre-burial uh, gathering of family and friends where, where food is shared, uh, some liquor is, uh, part, uh, is, is imbibed. And at that wake, they had a long wake, and it would, they were the wake started, I don't know, 5 a.m. in the morning. While they were at the wake, the police came for Mr. Henry, the father of Isaiah, to take him to the postmortem. One of the police officers who came to pick him up was actually investigating the, the murder. And these three young men, including the brother of Isaiah, were at that wake when Harris Singh was murdered somewhere between 9.15 and 10.15 that morning. So when the police arrested these men and accused them of murdering Isaiah, of murdering Harris Singh, sorry, the mothers of Isaiah and all the, the persons who were, uh, not all, several of the persons who were at the wake that morning who could vouch for the presence of the brother of Isaiah at that murder went to the police station to give alibi statements. And as soon as they arrived at the police station, they were promptly arrested by the police for the purposes of, uh, on the allegation, sorry, of perverting the course of justice. The other disturbing feature about that arrest is from the time those women, there were eight women actually, arrived at the Guyana Police Force uh, CID headquarters, there were about 15 video cameras, uh, video recording their every action. And just to demonstrate how bad it was, Every time one of those ladies went to the washroom, the video camera, the, the video videographer would accompany those ladies not only to the door of the washroom, they would enter the washroom with video cameras while they were in there in custody. Those women were detained for uh, between when they went to the station somewhere between nine in the morning uh, all the way up to 11 at night when they were then placed in the equivalent of $800,000 bail. These are rural folk who have no access to that sort of cash in Georgetown at that hour of the night. And they had to drive approximately 120 miles either way, uh, 164 miles one way and 64 miles back to actually raise money in the village and amongst the community to get bail that evening. Tragic footnote to that is that the mother of Isaiah, whose other son was charged with the murder of of um, Harris Singh, as a result of all the pressure, died about a month ago 
um, without actually seeing either the conclusion of the case of her son who was charged with murder or seeing a true and proper investigation into the murder of Isaiah, whose neck, as I mentioned before, was severed. Next slide. Uh, Orrin Boston, another particularly bad um, case of police execution. Orrin Boston at 4 a.m. Uh, in the morning was lying in his bed naked next to his wife asleep. Mr. Boston has no history of any criminal activity at all. He's never been arrested before. He's never been the target of a police investigation. So this is not someone that the police had previously expressed any interest in. While he is lying in his bed next to his wife in September 2021, uh, police officers storm his house, not by accident, they didn't go to the wrong home, storm his house, three officers enter his room and shoot him on the bed, lying next to his wife. And he died there. The initial police response to the murder was that Mr. Boston attempted to attack them. That's how come he got shot. When this was clearly refuted by his wife, who said, I was lying next to him. He was sleeping. He was undressed. When you came in and executed him on the bed, they changed that story. All the investigation, all the evidence, everything pointed to the offense of murder. He was lying unarmed, didn't move, in his bed, next to his wife, shot and killed. Eventually, after some, and this was a police squad that came from Georgetown into another part of the country. After some public pressure, the police officer doesn't get charged with murder. That police officer gets charged with manslaughter, which immediately entitled him to his bail. He's still in bail. There was a preliminary inquiry, and he's now awaiting trial in the high court. Quindon Bacchus in May this year, unarmed male African shot six times by police officers. Mr. Slow referred to this in his presentation. And of course, only African police officers ended up uh, getting charged. And then we have the very strange and peculiar case of Ms. Tamika Clark, a practicing attorney at law last month in October, went to Soku, which is a branch of the Guyana, Defense, uh, Guyana Police Force, to speak to her client. As a matter of fact, she went there on a Tuesday, spoke to her client, who was the subject of an investigation, advised her client to remain silent. She told the police officers on the Tuesday that her advice to her client is that he should remain quiet, uh, she should remain silent, sorry, in keeping with his protected constitutional right not to incriminate himself. And the police said, well, we'd like you to come back on Thursday. And she said, well, it's not going to be much different. I will advise him to remain silent. And the police officer said to her on the Tuesday, counsel, you are going to need counsel because if you come back on, Tuesday, on Thursday and continue to advise your client to remain silent, we are going to arrest you for obstructing justice. Ms. Clark returns with her client on Thursday. They were unable to see her. She was invited to return with her client on Friday. And on Friday, when she returns with her client, she maintained the advice to her client to remain silent. And she was promptly arrested by the officers of the Ghana Police Force, the Soku branch, uh, phone taken away, escorted into a, another room, and remained in custody for about an hour until it was evident um, the head of her firm spoke to the attorney general, and then after about an hour, she got released. Up to now, there has been no completed investigation and no charges by the state against those officers who unlawfully restrained uh, Ms. Clark. Nice little footnote to this is, Ms. Clark filed private criminal charges against the two officers who falsely arrested her and, re and kidnapped her effectively. Um, and neither we have been unable to serve the criminal charges on those two officers. The bailiff from the court has gone on no less than two occasions for the purposes of serving the summons on serving members of the Guyana police force. And on each occasion that he has attended to effect the service, he has been told that they are not present. So there has been clearly an attempt to frustrate the process of justice. May I have the next slide? So in conclusion, there are some possible solutions. One of them, of course, is evidently the inclusion of the intended beneficiaries 
of the economic decision making process. The, the, sorry, I should really say that the, the, the intended beneficiaries should participate in the decision making of the, uh, the uh, economic processes that leads to the award of the uh, and distribution of the state assets. Uh, that doesn't happen now. That happens by, like I indicated, you know, companies that don't have any um, prior experience in road building, et cetera, et cetera, win contracts. We have to identify the barriers that they are in the system. And clearly, if you've got this level of transfer of state assets between 92, 2015 and continuing between 2020 and 2022, there has to be some rebalancing of, of this because if, 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 if when the studies come out as to the size of that transfer and its effect on the communities that have been disadvantaged, both in terms of resources of health, in terms of health, education, um, for example, if, if the contracts had been more equitably distributed, people would have been able to operate their own companies, they would have been able to pay wages so that when somebody comes into your a community and offers you $250,000, if it had been properly allocated before, you wouldn't have to be in the position where you're happy. Um, of course, uh, the fourth recommendation, you have to build the assets and the asset base for the disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged businesses. And of course, we have to set criteria and manage the results of a new program designed to reverse and rebalance the current state of affairs. I, I think I've been with you and I thank you for in, your indulgence. Thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, forgive me for perhaps taking a little longer than I anticipated. Thank you, Dijel, and uh, thank you for all of the information you have provided. There are some little things that will probably come out in the question and answer uh, period. But uh, you did mention that you weren't able to check all of the quarrying um, areas there. And I, I happen to see a, a, a quarry that, that I personally know who the owners are. So as a journalist, I will, uh, I will say that as far as I know, Metallica um, is owned and operated by Glendon Archer and the Archer Brothers. Well, and they're well, African Guyanese. Right. So, and they, I mentioned the company, but I just said unknown because I didn't have that information at the time. And I thank you for that. No problem at all. So we'll move on to uh, some of the questions. And you're looking at a special presentation on African Guyanese and discrimination. And it's done by Ipadiji, uh, which is part of the International Decade for People of African Descent as Assembly Guyana. And it's a special presentation, a special forum. So we've got with us Nigel Hughes, whom you just heard from, uh, Gabriel Lal, GHK Lal, and we've got Paul Snow. Unfortunately, Trevor Ben cannot join us for this part of the presentation. But I want all the gentlemen on the panel to look at it from this point of view. Uh, some may say, well, look, this is just a matter of political power. It is, not, it is not about discrimination at all. It doesn't fall under the rubric of Article 149B, I think, of the Constitution, that it's because of the parents or because of what you look like. It's because you just didn't win. And you win political power and you share the corn. How do you respond to that? Enrico, I think, you know, you've touched perhaps not intentionally, but on, on, a, on a key issue. What you're saying, if you follow your line of reasoning, is this. Once you're elected, you're entitled to distribute these resources how you wish, without any regard to the structure of the society, and which is precisely what is going on now. So I get elected. I don't like, um, let's say, green people. So I make sure green people get no resources. And my basis for my biased distribution of the economic resources of the country is I'm elected. So I'm elected to discriminate in such a manner that I please. Now, I don't believe dem democracy is a concept and democratic governments um, c uh, can, can subscribe to such a principle. The fact that you you are elected entitles you to discriminate uh, in, the, in the manner. And, and I'm, I'm afraid the evidence speaks for itself, but I'm sure my, my, my fellow panelists have a view that may not necessarily um, be consistent with that. I think you're muted, Gabriel. I think in a plural society, 
if that course of action is contemplated and is, actu and is actually put into motion, which it has, has been in various sectors, then we really don't have a society anymore. We don't have democracy anymore. And you are staring down the barrel of something that really can be devastating, if not destructive, ultimately. Because as just as a matter of common sense, just as a matter of, are you going to have a set of people perpetually underfoot because I won? If, if maybe with a 10% presence in the population in, in the voting demographic, you may be able to get away with that. But if you've got, the, if you've got a group that is almost half of the electorate, given our voting patterns and given our razor-thin elections in the, in the past several cycles, and you say, I win. I say that I win. Therefore, this must follow. It follows, yes, to some extent, but not to this extreme extent that we are seeing here. Incidentally, I noticed in, in Nigel's presentation that in 2021, that there were 11 licenses issued for, for gold dealers. I want to tell you of the two African Guyanese, one was issued under my watch as the chair of the gold board. And that one hit the press and all kinds of, of insinuations were made on We had to clear that up very, very publicly involving Cameron and Shepard to take all the papers and the processes and the procedures and to pronounce on that. And they said that everything was followed. So therefore, there's nothing new here. So my my assertion would be to that my response to that question would be, hey, listen, one to, to take it to this extreme is really unprecedented, and it's it's what fuels discontent and God knows what. And also, it is it leads it's a it contradicts. The president's mantra, the government slogan of one Guyana. You listen to all the presentations here. Commander Slow, Attorney Hughes, myself, uh, former Commissioner Ben. Where's the oneness there? Where's the substance? Where's the essence of the oneness that is so that is being so highly touted? If anyone sees what I can't see, I seek the enlightenment. I, I, Enrico, I don't know. I just I just want to break lance with Mr. Lal on one point, which is this. Elections does not give you the mandate to distribute the natural resources of this country as you please because you were elected. That is precisely why we have laws that provide procedures, why we have the procurement commission. And so when you're elected, it is not as if you're elected to distribute the spoils and therefore you can do it to a certain extent but you can't do it as to, to this extent, because on that basis, the indigenous people of this country who are about 10% of the population, and I dare say there's no company that I'm aware of that has gotten any contract that is indigenous, they would never, ever be entitled under that system to anything. So the election is allows you to govern. It doesn't allow you to distribute the resources as you please. That's why you have robust laws oversight, procurement commissions, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's the only point of departure I have with Mr. Lau. Point well taken, Nigel. But if I can come in here again, I think Article 149 of the Constitution, and, and uh, Nigel is the lawyer on this panel here, uh, 1491B says that no person shall be treated in a discriminatory manner by any person acting by virtue of any written law or in the performance of the functions of any public office or any public authority. However, when you look at all the um, issues with discrimination under the, under the Constitution, it doesn't make allowances. It, 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 makes allowance, it makes allowances for, the Constitution makes allowances for the indigenous people, but not for anybody else. <laughs> um, so. You can you can talk about discrimination, but you can only talk about it with regard to to the indigenous. Uh, the, 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 the challenge here is Nigel, Paul, and Gabriel. 
is whether within our minds the narrative is that the purpose of government is not just to govern, but to empower their supporters. I heard a vice president, who was the former president, say, well, what did this previous government do for its supporters? I've heard supporters of the previous administration say, well, why didn't they do more for their supporters? I've heard persons who are supporters of the current administration say that they have to do stuff for us as supporters. Isn't that what is in, in, in the heads of, of, of persons? And how do we change that narrative? You, you're asking me, or, or I, I see Mr. Slow is venturing a, a response. Yeah, in relation to the force that I um, talked about, I mean, the thing is so uh, glaring because even before the elections, I think people who were um, or fay with what was going on knew that these plans uh, were afoot to, to, as some people said, Indianize the command structure uh, of the force. But as I indicated, you have a force which for uh, varying reasons is um, dominated in terms of the numerical um, setup by a particular ethnic group. And this is well known. I mean, they have said so repeatedly. And as I said in the presentation, efforts have been made over the years to try to deal with this um, numerical imbalance, as it is called. But it still persists. So how do you justify those, as I've said, um, in Region 1, the commander is um, in your Guyanese. The deputy commander is, um, I think, is a mixed uh, race. In Region 2, both the commander and his deputy are in your Guyanese. In Region 3, both the commander and his deputy, again. In Region 4, C, same thing. Sorry, not C, for B, both the commander and the um, deputy in the Guyanese. Region 6, same thing, both the commander and the um, uh, deputy in the Guyanese. And even the infamous Soku, you have the person charged as an Indo Guyanese and the, the, the notorious person who Nigel referred to eat uh, as a deputy in the Guyanese. So I'm saying that these things are very, very difficult. Um, to justify. If you're saying that the uh, rank and file is dominated by a particular ethnic group, then how do you justify the minority ethnic group dominating the command position? So, and I'm, as, I've, as I've said, it is clear that it is a, it is not a mistake. It is not a mistake. It's a deliberate plan to place these persons in, in position. And again, as I, I indicated, if these persons were qualified then you can make the argument, well, it's about merit and the fact that these persons are qualified. But many of them are not qualified to all those senior positions, whereas you have Afro-Guyanese police officers who are qualified, who are qualified, but they are sidelined because of their ethnicity. And it's a worrying thing because when you talk about the law enforcement, the major law enforcement agency in, in, in the country, this is happening to them, which creates... Um, demoralization. And one can see a trickle down effect where people decide, well, we're going to just go to work and do the barest minimum and let chaos reign. So it needs to be addressed and um, addressed quickly. Well, let me say this. If you, if you were, if we were talking that we are an equal opportunity society and that we are working towards a more enhanced form of merit, merit based merit-based decisions in various sectors. Based on the numbers that we have in place, African Guyanese are at a terrible, terrible disadvantage. Are you gonna, how are we gonna ever get to that state? How are we gonna continue as a polity? How are we, constitution and all, the, the real environment and all, how are we going to get to a place where we have this diversity of people? Our leaders say, yes, we are about this. Lips, lip service aside, the reality on the ground are these statistics, these experiences. 
there, so therefore, we might as well not talk about equal opportunity or merit-based or any such thing. In it, we should not have an ethnic relations committee. Uh, committee then, commission then. We should not have an equal opportunity set up in our head. We should not be concerned about those things. And this conversation should really be over based on what is, I won, therefore, this is what must and will be. Enrico, I, I am so happy that, that Mr. Lal and Mr. Snow have uh, said what they said. I, my, my views on this are a little more controversial. And they're this. We have never had one Guyana. Never. In the last 50, how many years? 55 years? We have had, on paper, a country that was inherited from the British. But it has been divided for its entire existence. A bit like U Yugoslavia. Um, and so, when we talk about... Guyana and, and your original question about what's in our heads, the reality is we live separate experiences. Now, that's not a problem because there are a lot of countries that are like that, but that's why you have to have a, a, a constitution and the rule of law, which everybody agree, uh, subscribes to. But more particularly what you said, when you get elected, you don't get elected. This is not the family business where the eldest brother gets put in the position of head of the family, and then he can distribute the family assets how he feels like. And that in and of itself is a problem. You are merely placed in a position of manager of the national patrimony of the entire country. Nobody put the oil where it was. Um, the oil was there. So it is not the PPP or the AP and you or the AFC to treat it as if it is their oil to do as they wish. This oil belongs to all the citizens of this country. And if you believe that because you are elected, you're entitled to reward your family, your friends, your relations with the national patrimony, that is a sad case. And you just have to look around the world to see what happens with that approach. You literally, if you put somebody's back against the wall, literally and figuratively, economically, and they have no options, and they're watching you distribute the entire patrimony to your friends and family, not a single oil block, not a single oil block has gone to an African Guyanese, none. Look at the road allocations, N not a single sure base, and that is billions of dollars to come in the future. Just look at the number for NRG, 600 million US dollars, they say. When you do that, just think about the impact it has on all those poor children who will not get a new education, who will never be able to be in a position where their companies will be able to win contracts for oil that belongs to each and every single citizen. None of us put it there. Some of us, historically, through enslavement, have paid the price for unpaid wages. But in terms of the oil, Nobody put it there. So it, it's, a, it's a spurious argument to suggest because you're elected, you somehow have the power to treat with this as if you're the chairman of your family company. It, it, it doesn't work like that. And there are obvious consequences, sadly, that come to this. And, and we're heading to that. I, I, I have no doubt Diana is going to reach that place. So before we get to that, please, um, Nigel. And, uh, you know, I'll get it today, but it's coming. Anyway, go ahead. So before we get to it. Can we implement uh, goals and have objectives that would make sure that we don't get to a place that we don't want to get to, but we get to a place that everybody, yeah. but everybody can share in, in the pie? There always is a solution. And the solution to most countries, the, the solution is political. And you have to have the heads, the political heads of the various factions sit down and talk. If the head of the IRA, which had dedicated his life to fighting the British, blowing up British entities all over the place, particularly in London, can sit down on the Christian Most Holy Day and arrive, sit on the opposite side of the table of people who have murdered their soldiers and whose soldiers they have murdered. You don't have to love anybody. That, that, I don't know why we think that this thing has to be love. There's no love here. 
but we can agree a common set of principles. And after we identify those principles, we can agree an agreed approach, how we are going to achieve it. And if, if we deviate from it, then we have agreed sanctions. But you cannot say that you're talking about national unity and you want to talk past the elected leaders of half the population or 10% of the population. Well, it's very easy. Let's take the indigenous community because that's easy. And we see it every time at election time, practiced by both major parties or all three, if you want to put the AFC in there. They go into the village and what they do? They, they buy a tractor, they buy a boat. And then in some cases, the day before election, they slaughter cattle and, and, and distribute it to the members of the indigenous community. If I keep you in a position of extreme poverty, of course, when I come and say, here is five cents, you're going to think I'm the best thing. I'm going to be close to God without realizing that really and truly you're entitled to $100 million because that is your share. So we can't, this discussion can't go anywhere unless we talk to the elected political leaders. You like them, you don't like them. I don't have to like Mr. Slow if he's talking on behalf of the people of BV. But if I have to come to a solution in relation to the lands in BV, I got to talk to Mr. Slow. And it's, it's not a precondition for me to like Mr. Slow. As a matter of fact, it's probably better if I don't, because then we will have at least a more candid engagement. So, you know, you can't talk past the leaders. People have their leaders, whether you like it or not. The PNC has consistently got 42% of the vote other than when they, they, they won. So what are you going to do? Talk past the leaders of 42% consistently? It, it, it's just not going to work. I think it's imperative that we have the conversation and we have it. As Nigel said, we have it and we have it now. Every day that is lost, we are going down a, a, a bad road. I think of Rwanda. And after the Holocaust that happened there, Paul Kagame, Paul Kagame, a fighter, could have said against, against the wishes of some of his closer lieutenants, let us extend the hand of friendship to those brothers of ours who were on the other side of the battle. That was one. Today, when I say today, in recent times, in Venezuela, after tremendous civil unrest, intense civil unrest, I hear that there are arrangements from Maduro and Guaido to meet. What happens? What has happened here in Guyana that we are talking about one Guyana and we can't even make the first step the first step towards that table of discussion. Notice I haven't gone to that point of the ultimate, which is reconciliation, to the table of discussion. We have to have that frank and honest and sincere conversation. And we are not having it. We are not bringing ourselves to it. And that is why one of my pet peeves is that we need to tell the outsiders, hey, listen, We've got to work through what is a national family affair. We've, we know our problems better than anybody. We know our hurts. We know our piercings. Therefore, we are in the best position if we can summon the authenticity to say, let me reach with you, look you in the eye, and then let us see how we can do what is best for all of our peoples. We're not doing that. But we have to get there, kicking and screaming, we're going to get there sometime. Enrico, again, I'm going to be controversial. There was no government, certainly in the last 80 years, that had more power than the South African government. It had the most powerful military in sub-Saharan Africa. It had more resources than anybody else to enforce apartheid. It, it uh, had the backings in the 80s of the U.S. and uh, British governments in the form of Mr. Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher. And no amount of isolation uh, uh, internationally affected that government. It was the most powerful economy in the entire sub-African continent. Good. South African apartheid system came to an end, and I dare say, with the greatest respect to Master Mandela, not because he was sitting in prison in Robin Island. He had moral suasion, but not because of that. It became unsustainable because 
the, the impact it had on the lives. Several people lost their lives. And if that continued, if you go to Mr. Biko and you come all the way through, it became unsustainable for the people who were head of the most powerful army, the most powerful economy. It became unsustainable because their existence became threatened. <laughs> now, this is just an example. This is not rocket science. This happens in every other place. I hear what Mr. Lal says about the Mr. Kangame, but if you want to have a country, then you, you got to look at how you're going to have a country. We don't have a country. We've never had a country. We got different people living together, created by the British. We have no common, there's nothing here that is common to all the people of Ghana. We never fought any war together. We we haven't had a common external element, uh, enemy. So Guyana really is an artificial place. Uh, the British brought it together in 1815 after the Napoleonic Wars and the Europeans had their problems. But we have no, this is not a natural uh, a society here. Um, we can work out what we want to do going forward. But the reality is that we just have to look at what else has happened in other parts of the world to know where we're heading. Um, and we can decide what we want to do. If people think it's okay, it's okay. Um, and I don't have a problem with that. But I'm just saying that we have to look at the empirical evidence and, and what is coming. Can we look at I want to add, Enrico, excuse me. I'd like right. to add something, please. Please, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry about this. When the U.S. ambassador and others keep talking about inclusion, have we thought about this? Her audience, it, whether it's national, it's also international. Her words are very, very much watched. She's like Alan Greenspan. When he spoke, he rocked markets. So in the context of Guyana, when Sarah Ann Lynn speaks and she talks about inclusion, she is sending a strong diplomatic message to the leaders in Guyana, particularly the president and the vice president, I may add, look, you better get close to this thing and better get serious with this kind of thing. On the, in addition to that, in, in addition to that, there could be a subtle signal intended or otherwise to foreign investors who may be looking at this and going through every syllable of inclusion, every letter of it and say, is this a place that is safe for our money? We are going to put 100 million US dollars there. And if this place is going to be unstable, if this place is going to be agitated, and the government doesn't seem to want to do anything about it, does this make good business sense? Again, so is she telling people not to come here? I don't think so at all. But she is putting them on the alert. This is what you have here. Save and accept again. I'm sorry, I don't know. Glenn and I seem to have a different, uh, so Gabrielle and I seem to have a different uh, approach this afternoon. Let me say this about oil in Guyana. The natives, i.e., the citizenry of Guyana, can go to war tomorrow. It will not stop the flow of a, not even an ounce of oil because the oil is offshore. And while the natives are fighting in the landmass, Guyana, the supply, the, the shore bases will move back to Trinidad and Tobago. They may move to Venezuela as there's a rapprochement, or more likely they'll move east to Suriname. So the, I, I beg to differ with Gabriel. Oil is such a powerful economy, uh, uh, commodity, not even the American government has been able to really manage it. So the, I don't think if the natives go to, 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 to war that the investment is going to stop. Not in oil, it might stop in other things onshore, because that oil is pumped offshore and the tankers will go and they will collect it. You can ask Iraq. Look at Iraq, you look at the war, the oil didn't stop pumping. So all that will happen is the natives will die and fighters, they always do. But the oil will pump. What happens to where the money goes is a different issue. And there are always arrangements that can be made. You can ask Libya. Look at Libya now. Different factions, different tribes, the, the, depending on which oil fields you control. And that's because the oil is unsure. You 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 can deal with it. So I, I really don't buy the fact that the, the American government is, of course, naturally, they will want a stable, uh, they want a stable backyard, of, of course. And if things look as if it's going funny, yes, it's a problem. But the second American lives get threatened, they're just going to move the shores to the bases to Suriname or Trinidad. I do that if I was an American. They, you know, you, you guys can go fight if you want. Look, I, I think, uh, I so, think, so, but before, before you come in, Paul, what, oh, okay. before you come in Paul, I think we need to look at the issue because remember, we're discussing African Guyanese, we're discussing what is happening in our society and whether discrimination has been taking place. It's not just a political question. 
Uh, the, one person has put out a question here. Uh, should the effort to address the imbalance be reflected in a law that is taken to Parliament? It seems to me, the person says, if that is left to political discretion, we will never get redress, uh, at the very least. If we have a legal framework uh, that would provide a, pa a pathway to begin to address the issue, and that is where I, I was going when I was discussing Article 149. Yeah, and Nico, I'm saying um, GHK mentioned the investment and you alluded to the security climate, and that, is, that has been my theme. Because if you have a security force, a major law enforcement agency that is dissatisfied because of what they perceive as discrimination, then you are not going to have the type of um, environment that is conducive to, to um, proper personal and other security and, and in, in investment. So should we address the question of whether there should be a framework that would specifically deal with the issue at a constitutional or legal level? I'm sure Nigel is going to expound upon this extensively, but I'll say this. I, I think it can't hurt. I think it cannot hurt. It will be a step up, several steps up from where we are currently. But I, as someone who has believed his entire life in a meritorious system and approach, I kind of shy away personally from a numbers-driven structure, which is inevitably where this, this is going to end up. You're going to say, for this to achieve fairness or equity or a non-discriminatory, a lesser discriminatory environment, then you're going to need to have this. And it's going to be, in my mind, some sort of number-based environment. And, and that all opens the door to all kinds of finagling. That's, that's my take there. Talking there about some form of affirmative action. I think that's what I'm hearing, no. perhaps under a different name. <laughs> well, you, you can only rebalance if, if you've got some form of, a, of affirmative action. I, I don't see how, I mean, if, if you're getting, let's say, a contract for a billion dollars, um, and let's assume between 25 and 30 percent is profit, that's $250 billion profit that goes to per contract to a particular community. No, that means that company gets $250 million, with which, so he's starting off at $250 million ahead of any African Guyanese company. So by the time you say, well, okay, we're going to start awarding road contracts to African Guyanese, um, and, and you, you want to start listing equipment, then they have the $250 million to start with that will enable, enable them to buy the, 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 the equipment that is, is required. So uh, this is where we need, uh, and we've embarked upon it already, studies that will take the, the data because we can't have a real discussion on this unless we have the data and the, the economists and the professionals to say what the impact is and how you redress the imbalance. Because it's not just a numbers in terms of dollars and cents, it's the impact on the economy. How many kids no longer go to high school but go to community college because the resources weren't allocated to them? And, and the whole range helps, for example, a whole range of other um, associated um, consequences. We are going to continue to ask the audience who has been with us to send in your questions. The uh, number of questions we've gotten centered around the constitutional amendment issue, legal frameworks. And one of the questions also dealt with the fact that the statistics are there. Uh, the, the, the numbers are there. And if the numbers are there, why it's so difficult, therefore, to prove that there is discrimination, that there, um, that, Racist considerations are being taken uh, in, 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 into play when, when decisions are made. Why is it so difficult for uh, people to understand that? Because we're an emotive society, um, Enrico. We we react to emotions. We we like you know the uh, the the the, the flair of the politician who you know, makes great statements, but 
you know, doesn't have to go to the facts. I'm afraid we're going to have to introduce, we don't have a culture where we look at data. We ought to have a culture where in parliament, you know, you you have debates about the data and, and you have, first of all, you have to have a, a culture about collecting data and disaggregating it. So the people who collect data, uh, whether it's the bureaus, uh, National Bureau of Statistics or whoever, need to collect data and start to disaggregate it. We think it's racist if you're collecting data on um, distribution of scholarships to say, well, so many Blacks, so many Indians. But it's necessary information because the only way you are going to be able to refute an allegation of discrimination or support it is if you have a commonly agreed um, data. And therefore, um, you know, how do we ensure that persons can operate in spaces that are created to assist them in becoming more involved and, and more informed, whether it is a, an educational system with equal opportunities for all Guyanese? That's one of the questions coming in. That whether we need to have a more diverse education system. And I remember J.H. Taylor mentioned the fact uh, that the education system, uh, even that is, is being affected. So do we need a, um, a more diverse education system with equal opportunities for all Guyanese citizens, including African Guyanese citizens? Well, well clearly we, we need a more diverse system, a more in, involved and inclusive a more comprehensive, a system that is more comprehensive in terms of its appearance, in, in, in terms of its substance. Look, let's face it, we're talking about primarily Indo versus African. We have a 10% indigenous community, and we must not ever forget about them. And that's not lip service. They're also part of this and in a mixed community. So we there is has to be this this extensive diversity. We have to, if we are going to get closer to this vaunted equality that we that we desire, but has eluded us. And I say we can arrange for, we can put in place systems, etc. But like regulation, we've got to fund it. We've got to empower it. You've got an a regulatory body, and if you strangle it of funds, you just you just short it of oxygen. If it doesn't have money to operate, if it doesn't have resources to do what it's supposed to do, to go out and to build people up, to recruit the kind of people that you're going you're going to need to make your vision a reality, the the letter and spirit of the law, whatever that law or rule or regulation is, you're going to need to have the funding and and the political investment in it. We have to have that political and moral and ethical investment in it. Look, we talked about in this country about transformational leadership. We talk about clean governance. Those are not buzzwords. They're not watchwords. Those are things that this country desperately needs. We get the kind of leader that say, look, I am not going to be a part of any program or any system or any structure that is so. Now he's going to lose some of his people who are going to say, well, we didn't put you in there for that. On the other hand, after some pain, we are going to, we have to have some pain to get some gain. There's no two ways about that. So some sacrifice is going to have to be made. Some less people are going to have to get on one side of the equation for African Guyanese or indigenous Guyanese to get some more. The rebalancing that we are talking about. Some, the redistribution that we are talking about. This, re, this new Guyana, this new one Guyana. For us to get there, there has to be a commitment, a political capital investment to get there. Now, you're going to say, well, why weren't you talking about this five years ago when the coalition was in power? We can go back there. You can beat me for that. We can relive that we can, as we are reliving the 60s and 70s. What does that do for us if the president has this dream about one Guyana? He's got to put some fuel into it. He's got to put some oxygen into it. 
I, we are ready by talking about it, saying, this is our story. This is our reality. Therefore, our hands are extended. Meet us halfway. Uh, Enrico, I, I, sorry. I, I'm Go sorry. Again. Go ahead. There are some people waiting to ask. Okay. I, Gabriel is, is the idealist. I am the one at the other end of the scale. I think we have to accept. We don't have inspirational leadership. We don't have good leadership available in the country. Don't let's aspire to what we don't have. We don't have it. We have this allocation of resources that goes to one community. My question is, what do we do where we don't have inspirational leadership, where we don't have uh, um, sort of particularly gifted politicians with the foresight? What is the next step? And we got to be driven by the information. I don't want to wait for an inspirational leader. We have what we have. If if you put Dr. Smith to be the president and Dr. Smith is not inspirational, we got to live with Dr. Smith. The question is, how do we deal with what we've had here? And just from the figures that, 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 that we have shown, it, it clearly is a transformation, a transfer of the natural resources to one community. Irrespective of who, who leads, the question is, what policies and programs have been put in place, first of all, to stop that immediately? And second, to rebalance, irrespective of who leads. I, I don't want to get in. I, I don't have hope. But, but, but Nigel, excuse me. I, I, got, I, I got to come in here. Excuse me. I hear you about the information. I agree with that. But given the you have the information basis, somebody's going to have to pull the trigger on that. So we come back to the leadership that is willing and ready and committed to buy from get, that bullet. So, Gabriel, if you don't get the leader, if you don't get some inspirational leader, what, what, what's it? There's no but, tomorrow. But the information, the information is not going to work up by itself. It's a passive piece of data. Ah, I beg to differ. If the articulation and the information shows that you got a cake with four or five slices and the four slices are going all the time to Mary and one slice going to John, and we look at what if what happens when that continues over a period of time, at some stage, John is going to be very unhappy because John, first of all, has nothing to lose. And the natural reaction of John is going to be X, Y, and Z. You just you pick your country in the world that this happened. So I don't need an inspirational leader to tell me where we're going. The figures tell us that this cannot happen. And history tells us it's not sustainable. So let us come up with a program. Uh, we have on record the Small Business Association, the Small Businesses Act. Let us start giving 20% of all the government contracts to small businesses. Let us help those small businesses manage themselves. And let us start putting checks. The, the waiting for, forgive me, for the Messiah to come ain't happening. We, it, he ain't been here for a long time. And I don't believe he come in just now or she come in just now. But... The point is, we have what we have now, and we have to deal with what we have now. I, I, I don't want to wait for the Jerry Rollins. Sorry, Jerry. What's the name of the guy from the IRA? Um, Adams. Adams. Jerry Adams. Adams. Jerry Adams. They have to wait for the right leadership to come. It, it was very simple. I, I think both sides knew what they were facing, and it's history that brings you to that position. But good, you don't need. We will step down from the. In inspirational leader and a transformational leader, then what we have to have, and I'm moving from this, we have to have a common sense leader driven by the information that says what we have been doing is not working. Therefore, we have to take these first baby steps. But common uh, sense leader. I'll settle for that. A practical man. But let me ask you a question, uh, Gabriel. Every day I come to you and say, Gabriel, your children coming in my yard and they teeth them of fruits. I come every day and I beg you, I say, Chief, please, the teeth them a thing and I can't eat my family starving. And you ignore me every single day. What, what must do next? Here's this. You're going back to one of my favorite themes. When I have nothing to lose, I have nothing to lose. And something is going to have to give. That's where we are. That's where we are heading. And that's what you and I are saying from different sides of the condo. Gentlemen, gentlemen, do, uh, I have a question in here. 
Uh, do the possible solutions mentioned in this forum for a prosperous future again appear ideal? Do they not appear ideal, in fact, what, this, what, what the person is asking? If yes, why? If no, what is, the, what is the next step or what are the next steps that must be done to make this dream become a reality, particularly for African Guyanese? And we can I just, I, I wouldn't I pretend to answer the question, but I say this. There is no doubt in Guyana Whoever is in office, you are going to see transfer. You're going to see unbelievable changes to the country simply because the economics drive it. Mm -hmm. The economics will drive Guyana. You will definitely get new roads, whether the PPP in office, the PNC, the AFC, because the country has been so poor for so long. And there's so many things that are so obvious that it needs roads, the ability to get roads to access, to remove your resources from where they are, gold to the port. Oil will drive that development, whoever is in office. And if you look at the traditional way in which Americans look at governments that are remain relatively friendly, uh, that will drive it. So we're going to get new ports. We're going to get to so all the fancy razzmatazz is going to come. The other reality with Guyana is that we don't have the human capital resources to be able to provide the economic support that those um, that the oil needs offshore. So there's going to be a lot of uh, foreign people who are going to come to the country because it's it's necessary. The Exxon Development Program is going is going to drive the country. And you don't have to be a magician to work out. Whoever is in office, you are going to see evidence of that. So whether you get new restaurants, new roads, that's, a, that's almost basic. The question is the economic plans for the future. Saudi Arabia, UAE, and all those countries have absolutely world-class systems. Ask what happens to the people who are really the subculture behind it um, and what is happening to them, and that's a different question. But the question is not whether Guyana is going to develop. Of course it's going to develop. You can't throw 11 billion barrels of oil, officially or unofficially it's somewhere else, into the country's future and not expect development. The question is what sort of development? And remember. Just like Venezuela, and it's always a salutary warning, when Mr. Chavez got into power, don't forget he tried a coup before that. And the mass of people that were living in the, the favelas of Brazil were living in, in, in the slums, that he was able to attract their support to win elected power and then make the changes that he did make, came after decades of deprivation. When Mr. Chavez got into office, there were 115 <laughs> private aircraft for different families in the country. So it may have taken a long time, it may have taken two generations, but inevitably the day will come. And so, you know, this thing about, oh, Guyana's going to go, of course we're going to go forward. You can't help but go forward if, if somebody's pouring X billion of dollars into your economy. You got to be stupid not to be able to go forward. Gentlemen, let me get another question in. Um, the issue of human capital, and, and, and I tell you, raised it. Uh, one, one, one Guyanese who has worked around the world in terms of, uh, of development projects has always pointed out that Guyana has wasted resources in terms of human capital. We've allowed that human capital to waste. And particularly for African Guyanese, some of whom ha have migrated some of whom have returned to Guyana, what can be done? Because this discussion is about the international decade of people of, of African descent. What do we tell uh, the UN? What do we tell the international community that Guyana needs to move forward? Well, I, 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 I think... That's that's certainly a, a, a third rail, a hot button. Our human capital is so scarce. We need to treasure what we have, and we haven't. So you use the word or the question, I use the word wastage. I look at the classic example, the, the ugly example of Dr. Vincent Adams. We don't have people who know about oil and gas. Let's face that. Or is this man was in the Department of U.S. Department of Energy for decades, controlled billions, tens of billions of U.S. dollars as an, as an annual budget. We had him here. He was doing some good things from what I understand. I have shared 
shared with him. The record is there. This is the kind of guy we need, whether it's the EPO, our own Department of Energy. He's just one example. We have some other, we have a, a rich diaspora. Lots of African Guyanese. So not only African Guyanese there, but because you are perceived or interpreted or concluded to be an opposition man, and because you're also African Guyanese to boot, that really is the end of you. So conciliatory again, con I think a more conciliatory approach that is in tandem in keeping with this one Guyana thing in our head, in, in the name. It put before the nation, we the hand of genuineness so that we can entice people to say, you're not setting a trap for me, but I'm going to have some sort of, I'm going to have some continuity here. So we and we set up that system, a program, a structure, call it whatever you want, to bring in people who have the skills we need, not only for oil and gas, but just to help us in our education sector, to help us in other sectors. I think this is where we can show that we are not just for one people or for people who were there for us in the trenches, in elections or historically or financially. We are there for people who have the requisite skills and recon recognizable skills, the proven track record. We want you here, regardless of who you are and what you look like. Uh, Paul, so there's a question that came in that said the uh, present government always talked about inclusivity within the police and discipline services. Um, and to, but yet the, the, the balancing has not uh, taken place in there, except as you said, uh, at, uh, the, at, 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 at the leadership level. Um, and that is to the, to the disadvantage of some senior officers. How could that be rebalanced? Um, and whether the the fact that you can you can do it economically, but you 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 you're not doing it at the level that uh, persons can feel comfortable to be in the discipline services. Well, and to, to answer that, what has happened now is not really a balancing. What at the at the top level here is really an imbalance. Well, let me say this: um, if we go back into the records. Um, you will see, and, and the studies have been done as to why um, Indo Guyanese are not attracted to the force. Uh, many, uh, we have many commissions in the investigations. But I can say this: efforts have been made over the years to make the um, situation more palatable, as as we will see. For example, in the early nineties, when Mr. Lailus was the commissioner of police, he opened the um, adventure, the Felix Austin Police Co College in Adventure, for the express purpose of attracting uh, Indo Guyanese in the, on the quarantine to join the force. That was an outreach. Um, that was done um, because it was always argued that if you have to leave the quarantine and those places to come to Georgetown to train, that might not be very encouraging because um, for your family to come and visit you, and if you have a, a two hour uh, pass is difficult for you to go and meet with your family. So that was established. That did not prove uh, very successful. A similar effort was made on the Essequibo coast. Again, when um, Larry Lewis again uh, opened the uh, Richard Feichel Police College at, um, at Anna Regina, again to attract um, Indo Guyanese, and and it does not work. So I think. The, the, the sociologists and these people have to go into perhaps greater detail. And as, as um, Nigel has been saying, we have to have um, the stats. We have to study this thing deeply to find out what has been happening so, uh, to, to continue to have this imbalance. Because as I've indicated, it is not a want of efforts. Efforts have been made over the years, um, but very unsuccessful. Again, we are discussing uh, racial discrimination, um, implementing achievable goals and objectives for uh, people of African descent in, in Guyana, and what can be done to ensure that any signs of discrimination, any 
uh, examples of dif discrimination can be brought to the fore and discussions uh, can move forward as, as Nigel Hughes has pointed out uh, with, with regard to what happened in, in Ireland, um, in Northern Ireland, what happened in, in Yugoslavia, um, what, what, what has happened in, in various parts of the world where there have been um, uh, this, uh, divisions. Now, the, the question is, the fact that we've always been talking, in fact, it is in our national anthem, we've been talking about one people, one nation, one destiny, now we're talking about one Ghana. To my mind, that tells you that we're not one at all. And um, this, this challenge that we have, at an international level, somebody mentioned, I think J.H. Uh, Kailan mentioned that the U.S. ambassadors mentioned the need for inclusivity. Should we have institutions in place that will deal with these issues and not just the Ethnic Relations Commission or um, any other uh, organization like that, but institutions uh, with, with teeth that, that can make things happen? I say, why not? I say in the absence of them currently, and we are the ones talking, we need to have that forum. We need to have that place where those who have been discriminated against, who feel that they have been victimized, have that place where they can art ventilate their circumstances. They can, they can, they can feel that they are gonna get a hearing some kind of an ombudsman situation, but in more of a, instead of a one man body or agency, you, you have a structured, this thing needs some structure. Look, you said one, one people, one nation, one, one destiny, now one Guyana. It seems as though we need to reassure ourselves about this myth, mythical oneness. So we keep telling us, telling ourselves about one, 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 and the more often that we repeat that, the more often it's going to happen by itself. Well, it's not going to happen by itself. We are going to have to put something in place. And I think we've got to start somewhere. Look, let's go back two and a half years. I think what we are seeing here, the punitive nature of governments, of governance, is a reflection of the traumas of 2018 December, no confidence motion to August 2020. How many months that was? 19, I think. I think there is that great anger that needs to dissipate. This is what is coming out. It was there before, but not at this intense level on the part of the People's Progressive Party and its leadership. I can tell you that people from the army or from other places their colleagues are now in government at very, very senior levels. And they say, look, you don't begin to understand the intensity of what is at the highest levels. And so it is a roadblock. It is a showstopper to all the things that we are talking about and we are pressing to happen. The, the government has to get past that. And when I say the government, we really know who we mean. It's not 40 people. It's not, it's really comes down to less than a handful of people who hold the cards, the keys, and to say, well, look, we're going to have a change of mindset. We are going to, our hearts are going to be less heavy. I, I don't want to preach here too much. And that we are going to go about this in a different manner. The time for that, for the retaliatory is past. Until we can get past they can get past our hurdle and persuade us by action, by continuous deeds, then look, the it is incumbent upon the government to do this. Right now, I am looking as an Indo-Guyanese at the PP government, which is an Indo-Guyanese government, and I'm seeing a vindictive set of people. I And this appalls me and it hurts me. I'm saying, look, we have to be better than this. We are better than this. If we are truly about what Guyana could be about, economy and autopilot and all of that, let us wrap our arms around 
our problems. And let us, in, let us talk to one another, not around one another, not to score points, not to prove points, not to see who's got the superior argument, but what fixes us, what helps us to straighten ourselves. And that's where I am. Gentlemen, you, you use the word vindictiveness. I, I would venture that vindictiveness comes naturally to some of these people. It's not easy for them to be magnanimous. And that is what that, that is a big part of the problem. That is, as one former minister um, said, that is part of their DNA. So it's not easy to reach across the aisle and to have a mature discussion. But remember, we, uh, oh, sorry, Nigel, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, to what Mr. Slow just said. You can talk now, or you can talk after the storm. But talk you will. It's not when. You will talk. If you're smart, you know what's coming. You talk now. You ain't smart. You will talk. But it's after what? <laughs> but Nigel, no, I don't know. Before, or even before, Miss. You see, when you, and if you talk now, my Nigel, you might be able to talk under uh, more conducive terms. But if you just wait for things to get um, bad, then the, the, the terms might not be that favorable. Well, look at, the, look at the lessons of history. All after all the hullabaloos and the agitations and whatever contradictions and conflicts have occurred, at the end of the day, the longest road always leads back to the table. But that's and conversation. Saying. But 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 no no no. But that is why that is why this particular Nico. discussion, this particular discussion, hold your thought, uh, Nigel. This particular discussion is a side effect of the first session of the UN uh, prominent forum for people of African descent, which will be which is taking place in Geneva next week. The focus of that meeting is on the elimination of racism, racial discrimination. That is why, to my mind, it is important. To have a discussion like this to inform the global community and the UN about what is taking place in Guyana and the fact that we need to talk now and hopefully we don't have to talk then. Nigel? Um, <laughs> you always, anyway, two things. One is there's a big difference between one people and one Guyana. One people assumes that everybody believes in the concept of one. And I think over the years, we've discovered that uh, you could be like, is it Jamaica? Out of many, you have one country. As opposed to saying all of us can to get together and somehow be one people. So we, we have some fundamental differences. Two, this country has never, ever in any period, and I say this without contradiction, not in Mr. Burnham's period, not in Mr. Hyde's period, not in Ms. Dr. Jago and Janet, Definitely not in Mr. Jack Deal, certainly not Mr. Ramatar, not in Mr. Granger, and certainly not no, has ever had consensus political leadership. I think it's a little more urgent than Mr. Lal would have us believe where we're looking for systems and 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 um discussions. If you are taking away from me the ability to economically survive. And every single day you are going into my neighborhoods and demonstrating how poor and helpless I am by giving me a 250, I'm going to fix your roof. All you are doing there is emphasizing my poverty and then telling me that you are the best thing that ever happened to me because nobody ever came in and did that before. When you, when you look at the numbers that are being transferred, 15 billion, 8 billion, 10 billion, which would put me in a position where you will have to come to me because I would be able to look after myself. I don't think we have the luxury of time because what you have done is you have put my back against the wall. You have handcuffed my hands to the post that is behind me. And then you're trying to tell me that you will allow me to be free when you have finished building your castle. And then I will leave you with just your, your undergarments and nothing else. No, we could want to believe that there will be a different outcome to those that scenario. The reality is that this corn in this country goes one place. And all the discussions you could have and all the aspirational talk and, and, and what you want about what you want about Guyana, it, it comes down to how the corn is going to be shared. And if you have already 
all the show bases one race. The export licenses, 18 and uh, the 90% going one place. All the offshore oil blocks never went to one population, uh, only went to one part of the population. And all, what, uh, 80% of the quarries are in what you are saying to me, I have no place in this country. I'm not an immigrant. I am not the descendant of an immigrant. I'm a descendant of a field slave. And if you're telling me that I have no place in the economic future of the country, I only say to you, what are the options you are giving me? Or you can say that, or, 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 or you may be told that your place is to work for them. And, 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 and that, that, that in itself is a danger. Um, you, know, you, know, you know, Enrico, you make a very good point. So you're trying to say, at the end of slavery, you say to the slave, look, your option is either you go back into slavery or you become an indention. That's really the choice you're telling me? And that is that really what you're saying? <laughs> because well, I think there's no other interpretation We're all there. entitled to part of Guyana. We are all equally entitled to part. That means we're entitled to part of the wealth. You run in to tell me that you can change my roof and give me $250,000 and I must be grateful and change my vote because of that when I see every single day the bulk of the economic resources going in one direction begs a lot of questions. That, that, that's my only position on this. We've got to wrap up, we've got to wrap up this discussion. I, I have to remind you, I'm told by the organizers, uh, that if you want to follow the conference, interested persons can go to HTTP. H TTP colon forward slash uh, twice hepatogy dot gy forward slash permanent forum and that is uh, part of the um, of the way you got here to begin with so you just continue to follow the permanent forum this way one quick thing before I go and it's it's a novel way of inclusion if you want to call it that but it also points to what may be discrimination. I'm speaking to you from the United States. The United, Guyana's ambassador to the United States is former Prime Minister Sam Hines. Normally, in diplomatic circles, in diplomatic procedures, you appoint the ambassador, the resident ambassador in a country, as a non-resident ambassador to another country. Guyana has appointed the deputy at the Guyana Embassy as the non-resident ambassador to Mexico for a Mexico. That's the example I wanted uh, to bring out. Whether in terms of how we do governance, whether we follow international procedures or we come up with novel ways of saying, you know something, Here's an African Guyanese ambassador in Washington, but he could be the ambassador only to the United States and to the OAS. And we appoint an Indian deputy chief of mission to the, as non-resident ambassador to Mexico and wherever else. Gentlemen, what do you think? Um, Enrico, <laughs> loaded question, but I will say this. I, I'm in support of every independent country in this world developing its own unique systems that suit its demands. Having said that, those demands at least should have some basic minimum international standards. The appointment of ambassadors traditionally is a political appointment. So governments change, they change their ambassadors that they send to different locations. Uh, that tends to happen certainly in, the, in, in, in most of the, 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 uh, the, I don't want to say Western, most of the countries that traditionally call themselves democratic. So you get elected, you're one of the spoils of office is you get to choose who goes to Washington, who goes to London, who goes to wherever. Um, so, and, and I believe that you have to, to create and craft policies that address um, your own unique circumstances. Having said that, in a country that has a long history of division and separation, a matter of fact, that has no history of unity at all at any time whatsoever, the question is going to be, if you want to at least appear to not to have been governed by the underlying realities of politics in Ghana, which is race, um, then you may want to craft a different way. That, that's, that's the way I would respond to that. 
my thinking on this is that it is enlightening as to how resourceful, how deep thinking the current government is, the PPP government can be, when it wants to arrive at a preset conclusion, using that example of the chief of mission to non-resident to Mexico. So to put that in another way, if this government really wants, the leadership of the government really is interested in addressing what it knows, it full well knows, is happening in the African Guyanese community. It doesn't need Nigel's spread, uh, PowerPoints to tell it, to emphasize to it, to embarrass it. That this is really what you've been doing. It knows that all too well. So just as how it can sit back, it's people, it's brain trust can sit back and say, we will get GHK allowed to go mission from Washington, D.C. to, to non-resident to Mexico City, it can also sit back and spend the time and expend that energy to say, what do we do to address our burning, thorny issue right here in the domestic environment, particularly as it involves primarily our African Guyanese community and our indigenous com community? Let these people feel that they are a part of the patrimony let them live with dignity. That is due to them. That is due to them. This is not a handout. This is not charity. This is not a nice thing to do. This is there's a duty to do this. Gentlemen, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm going to ask each one of you to give me a, a 30 seconds or a minute of your thoughts just before you go. And I begin with uh Mr. Slow, because um, he he was not able to get into this part of the discussion. So I'm going to ask you, Mr. Slow, to, to wrap up. Um, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Hughes, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Lau. Uh, thank you, um, Enrico. Uh, thanks for Apology for off offering me this opportunity to um, highlight certain um, grave security, what I consider to be grave security issues. And I think. Um, the discrimination is real. The figures are there to support that contention. Um, and no amount of window dressing, no amount of propaganda is going to um, change that. And I, I, as I indicated, I believe it's a deliberate effort to have this thing skewed in a particular way. And I would hope that the authorities will rethink and realize that uh, going down this road uh, does not argue well for a stable. Um, environment. We're talking about investment, we're talking about tourism, and therefore we need to have a vibrant, proactive, um, motivated uh, police force. And certainly what has been going on over the past two years have not been leading to, to, to that type of force. So I would hope that they can address, when you talk about promotion, you talk about um, the command structure, these things need to be addressed so that um, we can have something Positive. And let me let me want to close by saying this too, because the ranks in the force, even though they are going to um, speak about it quietly, they are so intimidated, they are so afraid they are, that they are not going to speak out. Most of them, they will call and they will speak about it. But as, again, I say the figures are there, so it's not only people we might want to label as being mischievous who are making these allegations. You look at the figures, and um, the facts are there. And as one former commissioner uh, of police in Ghana used to say, facts are stubborn things. They are there for you to see, for you to make your own um, judgment. So once again, I am grateful for this opportunity to, to, to bring this um, form of discrimination uh, to, the, to the fore. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Enrico, thank you so much for hosting this program. I want to thank Epagity Guyana for affording me an opportunity to be in the program and to present the data that I've gathered. I don't have any great philosophical uh, comments, save and except that I hope that all discussions in Guyana are driven by data. And once we have that data, that we have a real discussion based on the data. Um, the time for having you know emotive conversations and hurling accusations at each other 
is long gone. The society, I think, is ruptured. It's almost irreparably ruptured, uh, getting close to irreparably ruptured. And the only way that we can begin to have a conversation is by gathering the data. Um, this is a first step. Um, I'm sure we can do a lot more forestry we haven't spoken about, uh, many other things we haven't spoken about. And then let us begin to have a discussion, not between friends, because there are no friends here. There's no love lost between the, the political factions in Guyana. Let's face it, our leadership just don't like each other. That's a fact. They're being led by people who don't like each other. And don't. It's not for us to hope that we get somebody different. We don't. So the question then is, there's so many examples of in history where we're led by people who don't get on. Let us look at the data and carve the solutions, find the solutions, and they're all over the world. We've got history. We, they're, they're the history of several examples of what has tried, what has worked, what has not worked. And let's go down that line and, and let's save the kumbaya, I love you sometime for some time in the future. It ain't coming. Thank you. Yes, I want to thank the people at it powder G for giving me this opportunity. I'm honored to have shared in it. I'm also horrified that we, it is necessary, it's compulsory that we have to have this conversation, this kind of conversation in the 21st century in an independent nation of over half a century. We are making some first baby steps I think the facts are irrefutable. Some are public, some are behind the scenes, but they all add up to a pattern of discriminatory practices that infect our polity and that impact the African Guyanese community tremendously. The facts are irrefutable. I do not think, I think that our circumstances are reversible. If there, there are going to be people, hopefully, I think maybe even right now, from the People's Progressive Party who are listening to this, who will in time come to, to, to absorb this, and I think it behooves them to say, we have, a situa we have a national set of circumstances in our hands, and we can do something about it. It cannot be unilateral. It must start now, and it must involve all. Thank you again, and God bless Guyana. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, on behalf of Ecology, I'd like to say what they have been saying. While the constitutional framework provides for the protection of rights, the institutional framework for the exercise and protection of those rights are either not in place or dysfunctional in Guyana. And given the matter, the manner in which Guyanese of African descent have been oppressed and marginalized from their force coming to present day, internal reparation is also a dire need if they are to benefit equally from the nation's patrimony. And that is a, 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 a position of Epatogy. And this program was uh, a special side event that uh, was presented by Epatogy Guyana uh, with regard to what is happening in Guyana and how the international community and the UN can assist Guyana in moving forward. Thank you very much for staying with us for the last uh, uh, two hours and a half. And uh, thank you for to the panelists uh, for their uh, excellent and brilliant uh, presentations. I'm Enrico Wilford. Have a pleasant rest of the day. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Goodbye. Hey, sporting fans, it's here. Yes, it's the Club Twilight Old School Thursdays featuring selector Delta and DJ Bishop. Yes, this Thursday, come on down to Club Twilight, sideline down Boxton North for Old School Thursdays, karaoke on demand. Yes, selector Delta and DJ Bishop for the ones and twos, karaoke in the house and lots of old school style. Come check it out. 
this Thursday at Club Twilight Sideline down Buxton North. Big up yourself and go on. Club Twilight Promotions that. The World Bank reports that Guyana will earn more than 20,000 US dollars for each citizen. Hey, sporting fans, it's here. Yes, it's the Club Twilight Old School Thursdays featuring selector Delta and DJ Bishop. Yes, this Thursday. Come on down to Club Twilight Sideline down Buxton North for Old School Thursdays. Karaoke on demand. Yes, selector Delta and DJ Bishop on the ones and twos, karaoke in the house, and lots of old school style. Come check it out. This Thursday at Club Twilight Sideline down Buxton North. Big up yourself and go on. Club Twilight Promotions that. The world. Hey, sporting fans, it's here. Yes, it's the Club Twilight Old School Thursdays featuring selector Delta and DJ Bishop. Yes, this Thursday. Come on down to Club Twilight Sideline down Buxton North. For old school Thursdays, karaoke on demand. Yes, selector Delta and DJ Bishop on the ones and twos, karaoke in the house, and lots of old school style. Come check it out this Thursday at Club Twilight Sideline down Buxton North.